All right, chapter 25 is another crossover chapter into biochemistry. So we're not going to spend a lot of time on it, but I did want to give you guys an intro to biochem. So we already went over carbohydrates. Now we're going to jump into amino acids. And amino acids, I'm sure most of you have seen in your biology classes and maybe even other chemistry classes. They generally have some sort of R side chain. They've got an amino group on one end and a carboxylic acid on the other. And these are the building blocks for proteins. We're not going to go into the whole uh, dogma of biology, but proteins have these really, really strong bonds in them. I'm actually trying to get them to offer biochem here. The problem is we don't know if the demand would be great enough. We have to have a class of about 24 to make it cost effective. All right, so this would be a polypeptide, right? Or a protein. And if you remember, I showed you guys Kevlar, and Kevlar had these same amide bonds in them, right? These bonds are exceptionally strong for biomolecule bonds, and it's a really good thing. We don't want our proteins to fall apart um, willy-nilly. We want to be able to cut them um, wh where we want and when we want. So all of these bonds right here are considered amide bonds, and they're very important in um, this sort of chemistry. They're very strong, unique bonds. All right, so let's take a look at this chart. This chart I pulled from the website Compound Chem, if you guys don't have it. I really like it just because it's laid out in an easy to read fashion. But we've got a whole bunch of amino acids, some of which are considered aliphatic. What does aliphatic mean? It has sections that aren't aromatic. Yeah, it has sections that aren't aromatic, right? So typically it's got alkane groups coming off of it. So like alanine, the R group coming off of alanine is a CH3 group. Glycine just has hydrogens off of it. And then once we get into isoleucine, then we start having these more complicated branching patterns coming off. So you can see we've got different hydrocarbon groups coming off. So those are all the aliphatic hydrocarbons with red circles around them. The aromatic ones obviously have aromatic groups. And then he goes on and classifies them even further with acidic and basic circles. So some amino acids are a lot more acidic than others. Does that mean they have a higher or lower pKa? More acidic? Lower pKa. So we'll talk about this. The pKa values for amino acids aren't as clear as you might think because you've actually got two different acidic sites on it depending on the pH. So we do have to talk about that. And then he's got other ones that contain sulfur. So cysteine is really, really important. Cysteine is responsible for cross-linking in proteins and provides a huge amount of structural support. Um, and then we've got um, a bunch of other types too. These are the most common ones. There are also other ones that contain um, atoms like selenium in them, although they're somewhat rare. So these are the key ones that you'll see in your biochemistry course. Depending on your teacher, if you take biochemistry, they may or may not make you memorize all of these along with their corresponding structures. However, I'm not going to ask you guys to do that in one week. All right. So you're welcome to grab this chart if you'd like. Um, I've got a bunch of extras on the front, and it's posted on the website. All right. So let's focus on drawing for the time being. So amino acids can be drawn using the Fisher representation, too. And they're pretty interesting, in my opinion, and I'll show you guys why. So here's one of them. It's like a soothing waterfall in here. <laughs> I'm just going to draw down a couple of them. Got 
at ch ch three two. All right, the one on the far left is alanine. That one's easy to remember because it's got a methyl group coming off of it. If you have the chart, which one has a CH2OH coming off that R position? Does anybody have their chart? Serine? Serine, yep. What about the isopropyl group coming off that R position? Leucine. Leucine. Or is that right? Uh, Leucine has too many. Leucine has too many. Uh, sorry, valine? Yeah, valine. Okay, so you can identify them this way. Typically, the R groups are in the lowest position, which is a little bit unusual. What do you notice about the nitrogen? Is it in the D or the L position? Yeah. L. So all of these are pointed to the left, which means this is L alanine, L serine, and L valine. So typically, all of your natural amino acids are going to be L conformers, not D conformers. The interesting thing is that your body is really, really picky about which one it gets fed. And I found this article a couple of years ago that I thought was fascinating, where all these people were dying in China from mushrooms, and people were struggling to understand what the toxic agent was in these mushrooms. What they went through and found was that it was actually these amino acids, essentially. And what they found was that these amino acids are deconformers. And so the body kind of panicked, put them into proteins in incorrect spots, and then you got super duper sick from the incorrect isomer of the amino acid. So it is kind of weird that way that all of the sugars that are natural are D, and pretty much all of the amino acids that are natural are considered L amino acids. I, I mean, people just try things, I guess, and then if you get sick, you know not to eat it again. <laughs> or your family learns. Uh, so interesting article on here. I'll leave it on the notebook, but it's kind of a fascinating um, thing to see that this mushroom produced a quote-unquote unnatural amino acid that poisoned people. All right. Amino acids do a lot of unique acid-base chemistry. And I'm sure if you've taken biology, you've talked about this already. But let's just draw our generic bond line amino acid. And got my NH2. So this is in its neutral form. However, in the body, we typically have a pH of around what? Well, we're talking about blood. Yeah, consider like just your generic blood. 7.4, 7. 7. right? So physiological pH. What do you think it's going to do to the amine portion? Protonate it, right? So under physiological pH, the amines will get protonated. So it would be NH3 plus. And what about the carboxylic acid? Deprotonate it. What do we call molecules that have both positives and negatives in them? It's witter ion. So it really depends on the functional groups coming off of your amino acid. Sometimes those R groups themselves contain acidic functional groups as well, at which point you can deprotonate those, or that R group can contain a basic functional group and get protonated at physiological pH. Is there still going to be a wedge? Yeah, so this carbon still has a assumed hydrogen sticking back, right? Oh, okay. Yeah. So it's pretty interesting that way. Um, it's not easy to remember the pKa values. So typically what most chemists do is they just refer to a chart. And table 25.2 has a list of pKa values. for the carboxylic acids. And ammonium ions. The thing that confuses people is when they look at these, they think that the pKa value listed for the nitrogen is the pKa value for this. Is it? No, it's the pKa value for the charged species on the right. 
So you do have to be aware of that. The PKA values are looking at completely different um, charges depending on whether or not it's a carboxylic acid or an ammonium salt. Does that make sense? I'm not going to make you guys get too far into that, but you'll probably have to use it a lot in your biochemistry course. All right, there's also something called the isoelectric point. The isoelectric point is the pH at which the Zwitter ion is at its higher, highest concentration. Whoops. And this is pretty easy to calculate. Typically they call this PI, and it's the pKa of your carboxylic acid plus the pKa of your ammonium ion. Divided by two. So really it's just the average of those two pKa values. So it's a pretty interesting thing. Um, if you're in a lab and you need to purify proteins or individual amino acids, you can actually subtly change the pH by providing the appropriate buffer condition and then do gel electrophoresis to actually separate things out based on whether or not they're charged. Um, so it's a pretty common technique once you get further into biochemistry, but you can purify amino acids and or proteins using electrophoresis at the proper pH. Have you guys done any of that in your yes. labs here? Yes. You guys have? Yeah, so gels are pretty dang common once you um, get into research labs. They're one of the most common ways of purifying biomolecules. All right, so now we have to talk about amino acid synthesis. And again, a lot of these reactions are more historically important than um, uh, useful for synthesis, but I will show you one last um, synthesis that's actually used still today. All right, so amino acid synthesis. We'll start out with Hel Volhard Zelensky, if you guys remember that one. You remember we covered this way back in chapter 22 feels like an eternity ago and that's the reaction where you alpha brominate a carboxylic acid right sure. what reagents did we need to alpha brominate a carboxylic acid, Wasn't it acid not quite We had to convert the carboxylic acid to an acid bromide. That's my hint. PBR3. So phosphorus tribromide and bromine. And then in step two, you treat this with water to convert that acid bromide back to the carboxylic acid. But when you do this, you can alpha halogenate. The one pitfall to this is it's not stereoselective, right? So you aren't going to get exclusively a wedge or a dash. It's going to be a mixture of products. Then in this next step, it's pretty straightforward. All you're going to do is treat this with ammonia in excess. And you can actually swap out that bromine for nitrogen. And again, this is still going to be a racemic mixture. However, you can purify these using chiral columns. Yeah, so chiral chromatography isn't widely used 
for purification because it's very expensive. But essentially what you're doing is you're pushing this through a stationary phase or a column that has a chiral substrate on it. And so different enantiomers of a compound will travel at different rates and you can actually separate out a racemic mixture. But it's a pain, it's not very easy to do, but it can be done. Yeah, you'd lose 50% of your yield right off the bat. So that's why it's not typically done very often. So because of that, other systems were developed. And there's one that's based on the malonic ester synthesis that we saw earlier. And this was covered back in 22.5. So instead of diethyl malinate, we're going to use a slightly different starting material. And this can be purchased. This is called diethyl acetamidomalinate, or malinate, sorry. It's a mouthful. But the chemistry is really similar to what we've seen already. So let's try to do this. So step one is sodium ethoxide. What do you think is going to get de deprotonated? Wouldn't it be the nitric acid protons? This is a good question. The the yeah, this is a little bit weird. So. When we talked about acid-base chemistry, we said the first thing you look at is the atom, right? With the one exception being nitrogen. So nitrogen, even though it's electronegative, it's really hard to deprotonate amines. So in this case, it's not going to be the nitrogen that gets deprotonated. So knowing that it's not the nitrogen, what's the next one? Yeah, exactly. This alpha position is unusually acidic because it's in between those two carbonyls. So first step, we're going to deprotonate that. We're going to turn that into an enolate. And then we're going to treat this with some sort of alkyl halide. So that's exactly what we did in the malonic ester synthesis. I'm not going to show the full enolate formation just for the sake of time. And there we go. So we've got this intermediate. What do you think will happen when we treat this with acid and heat. What's going to happen to one of these esters? It'll fall off as CO2. CO2. Okay, what's going to happen to this ester? Okay, converts to an OH. I'm not going to show this full mechanism. And then last but not least, what do you think is going to happen to this acyl group? Yeah, it's going to fall off. So basically we're going to blow apart this molecule and see what we get out. Okay, so now that we've got that, let's redraw this. Actually, because this is under acidic conditions, this nitrogen is going to be protonated, right? And again, we're running into this problem where we lose all regiochemical control. What's that? Oh, sorry, this should be an OH. Thank you. So we're going to have a mixture of different <coughs> stereoisomers in here, right? So again, the next step you would have to do for this procedure is to purify using chiral chromatography. But when you do this, you can get out your amino acid. And a pretty reasonable, respectable 50% yield, right? Not too bad. All right, there's a couple other old ones too. Yep. Does that ketone blow off the one attached to the nitrogen? 
So you're talking about why does this acyl group fall off? Yeah. So you can protonate that, water attacks in, and it's a bunch of proton transfers, but it, we did cover this when we talked about amide cleavage back in the carboxylic acid chapter. So really this is an amide that you can oh, cleave, okay, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so there's one more that's an old school one, and then we get into the fancier new ones. This is called the Strecker synthesis. And the Strecker synthesis is also really similar to what we've seen before. But this one starts with an aldehyde. All right, and we're going to treat this with ammonium chloride and sodium cyanide because we like to live dangerously. What do you think might happen here? First of all, what do you think the ammonium chloride is going to do? So just ignore the sodium cyanide. So think of it this way, right? We've got an aldehyde, we've got a primary amine, and ammonium chloride, slightly acidic. So what functional group will we get out of the first step? Close. So you go through your imine, right? So this imine, under this first step, can actually be protonated as an aminium ion. And then the cyanide can really quickly attack in, kick up electrons. And we've got this cool intermediate here. <laughs> All right, next step, we're going to treat this with acid and heat. So what do you think will happen? What will this nitrile turn into if we really crank up the heat on it? Carboxylic acid. So you'll go past the amide all the way to the carboxylic acid. That's what we saw in one of our pods. So let's draw this converting to that carboxylic acid. And I should, just to be correct, draw this as a protonated nitrogen because it is under acidic conditions. And then last but not least, we have to purify this because this is still going to be a mixture of products. We've lost stereochemistry, or stereochemical control, I should say. And we will get back to our final amino acid. It looks like that. So all of these were the historical reactions that were used to make um, amino acids. They weren't that good because immediately you're losing 50% in your last step. So I'll show you guys a more modern synthesis. Does it what? <coughs> no, however, I will talk about that. So let's talk about the enantioselective synthesis. Okay. So what you can do is buy this starting material. We're not even going to cover how to make it because you can buy it really cheaply. But you can buy this in kilogram quantities from many different chemical suppliers. All right, and then in the next step, you're going to do a hydrogenation. However, instead of using platinum and palladium or anything like that, you're going to use a chiral catalyst. And then in step two, you 
got to cleave off that acetate group. So they use sodium hydroxide, water, and then do a gentle workup with acid. And when they do this, it's kind of neat. But because a chiral hydrogenation was performed, they don't have to do any purification with chiral chromatography. If you do it correctly, you get an enantiomeric excess of about 99%, which is pretty dang good. So the chiral catalyst that's used for this is pretty crazy. I'm not going to expect you guys to remember this, but I'll show you guys what it looks like. I really like these catalysts because they're chiral in a non-normal way. So the chiral catalyst that's used is called R plus ruthenium binap dichloride. All right, so what you have are these aromatic rings. This ring's kind of puckered forward, so I'm going to show that more like that. And then down here, you've got another aromatic ring. But this time, these positions are kind of puckered back. So can you guys kind of imagine this twisted along this central bond axis? So the top one's kind of twisted away from you, the bottom one's twisted towards you. And then what they have off of these positions are phosphorus with two phenyl groups. And these phosphorus atoms are really good ligands for ruthenium. So I'm just going to show it as ligands to ruthenium. And then we've got two chlorines coming off of ruthenium as well. So students will look at this and they'll say, there's no stereocenters in here. How could it be a chiral catalyst? Does anybody know? Kind of. Do yeah, it's because of the twisting. So do you guys remember, this was way back in first term where I talked about allenes? That was where you had two double bonds right next to each other. And we said that there weren't carbons that had stereocenters in that, but that was an example of a chiral molecule because it was non-superimposable on its mirror image. This is the same thing. They call this axial chirality. So it's your non-traditional chirality, but these are really common for metal ligands now because they're relatively easy to prepare. So I just wanted to show you this, show this to you guys in case you take more advanced inorganic chemistry. You may run into these ruthenium um, axial, um, or these ruthenium lig ligands that have axial chirality. And it's pretty interesting, you typically don't use the same sort of um, system for assigning R or S anymore. You have to use a different system. All right. Make sense? <laughs> I think what we may do is stop today. Um, and then tomorrow what we'll do is go into peptide synthesis. Peptide synthesis is really interesting. Um, it's one of the new branches of chemistry that's exploding right now. So what I'll do tonight is I'll put an interesting article on the website about the future of organic chemistry in case you guys are interested in learning about it beforehand. So what exactly is 